Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening discussing using forage quality to market hay. My name is Tom Keenan with the University of Kentucky. I've been working with industrial hemp the last two or three years and have been asked to come on this evening to talk about something that I worked with for a long, long time prior to my work in hemp, and that is marketing hay. So we'll jump right in. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. Anytime I do a presentation like this, I always like to leave people with information to where they can go to either get what I'm talking about or other information when it comes to forages and hay. These are just a few of the websites. Obviously you're aware there are thousands and thousands of sites on the web that you can go to, but these are some of my favorite ones. The first one you see listed here is the forages website from the College of Agriculture. We will actually go to that here shortly and look at something. The second one, kyagr.com, that's the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. Another very good page uh, there, where you can find their hay testing program. Foragetesting.org is the home page of the National Forage Testing Association. We'll touch a little bit on that as we wrap things up this evening. One thing I always encourage farmers and producers to do is to subscribe to eHay Weekly. It is an electronic publication that comes out weekly. It comes out on Tuesday. It does not cost you anything, but there's a ton of good information that comes with that publication. And one of the things that I like the best about it is that it has weekly hay prices. And so when it comes to marketing quality hay at a fair price, that's a really good site to go to to get uh, current hay pricing across the country. And lastly is the link to our forage decision aids, again, that we'll be discussing here shortly. Uh, again, just some of my favorites to go to on the web. There are many, many, many others that you can access from the web. Some printed materials that I always like to mention are the Southern Forages book that uh, our own Dr. Lacefield helped co-author on that. And then the pocket guide that corresponds to that that you can actually keep in your pocket, as it says, or in the dash of your truck or something like that. So again, there are tons of other printed materials out there, but these are just some of my favorite uh, as we move forward. I mentioned the Forage homepage. You may have already seen that from some of the other presentations, but this is an extremely good present, uh, excuse me, an extremely good website to go to. Tons of videos. Dr. Toich and his crew have done a great job in doing that. Uh, when you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you're going to see our decision aids. Again, we'll look at that here just shortly. Hay is big business. In 2020, there were over 52 million acres of hay harvested in the United States. That ranks third only to corn and soybeans. It had a value of about $18 billion. Uh, so again, a lot of money there. In Kentucky, we're a little over 2 million acres harvested and a lot of money is involved there too. Hay sales are really go on all over the place. I mean, they're sold, hay is sold locally, depending on what county you may be here in Kentucky. You may sell it across the state. You may sell it out of state. Uh, you may sell it internationally. Uh, Kentucky hay that's produced, we export that to other states. And then, of course, we import hay uh, from other states into Kentucky. So we, we uh, kind of have it both ways here. Um, if you're in the hay business, you essentially have two markets that you market to. You either market to your own livestock enterprise by feeding your cows and calves or your dairy cows or your horses or whatever the case might be, or you might be in the cash hay market. Either way, you are a hay, hay salesperson. You're not a car salesman or anything like that, but you are a hay salesperson if you deal in hay. In another life, prior to working uh, in hemp and here at the University of Kentucky, I was in the hay and straw business. And for 16 years, I traveled this country looking at hay to source for different markets to move around the country and overseas, actually. I, I looked at hay farms and hay operations from New York to Southern California, from Washington State to Florida and everywhere in between. And it always upsets me a little bit when I hear people say, well, we can't grow as good a hay in Kentucky as they can grow in other parts of the country. And that is just absolutely not true. We can grow excellent forages here in Kentucky. 
Uh, we do have a few hurdles to overcome in order to do that, but don't let, don't let anyone ever tell you that we cannot produce as good a hay in Kentucky as they can produce anywhere. Now, in order to sell hay, again, through your own livestock enterprise or uh, in the cash hay market, you have to know what your input costs are. What does it cost you to produce that bale of hay or that ton of hay? If you don't know what that is, you really are at a disadvantage when it comes to selling your hay. So this is the tool, the forage decision aid that I mentioned to you a little bit earlier. You can see that right here. Um, it's very interactive. All these numbers in blue, you can change. Uh, you can actually change these, uh, this amount here um, and so forth. But I like for farmers to go to this because it really gives them an insight. I'm going to try to go to that actually from our website. So I'm going to step out of here. I'm going to go to our forage extension home. You saw that just a little bit earlier. Okay, I'm gonna to scroll to the bottom of the page. Uh, under resources, you see decision aids. I'm gonna click on that. These are all the decision aids that we have. I'm gonna to go to forage enterprise budgets. I'm going to open that with Excel. Let that pop up here. We're going to enable editing. We're going to maximize that screen. We're going to go to the, you see the tabs here, alfalfa, hay, grass, mixed hay, pasture maintenance, and so forth. We're gonna go down to alfalfa hay at the bottom. We're gonna click on that. Again, this is exactly what you saw on the other page there. We're just doing this live right now. So no, we're not gonna do 100, excuse me, we're not gonna do 200 acres of hay. We're only gonna do 100. So we're gonna go up there and we're gonna change that 100, okay? And you see how those numbers automatically changed. Everything was cut in half. Uh, we're not gonna get 175 bales per acre. We're gonna get 200 bales per acre because we have a good fertility program. And rather than a 60 pound bale, we're gonna have a 50 pound bale, okay? And so that tells me I'm getting five tons per acre, which is pretty good. Uh, for alfalfa, we probably uh, see a little more than that, maybe even double in some cases. Uh, we have a unit price of 125. Again, for 100 acres, that gives us $62,000 worth of total income. I think we can do better than $125 per ton if we've got some really nice alfalfa hay. We're going to put $200 a ton in there. Okay. We're going to go over here and we're going to hit enter. And then again, you can see that that changes those numbers. Down here, we have variable cost and so forth. We see that here is our return above variable cost when we look at that $52,519. Then when we take out our fixed cost, our return to land and management is about $40,519. Okay. If we Divide that by 100 acres, that gives us about a return to land management of about $405 on a per acre basis. Okay, so we can compare that to corn and beans, whatever the case might be, and we can actually see that we're, um, we're doing pretty good. What if we're only getting $100 a ton for that hay? Okay, we put that number in there, and then all of a sudden, you can see that when we get to return to land and management, we're at a negative number. So. Again, I just want you to see that this is a tremendous tool that you have uh, at your fingertips and that I would encourage you to use. So again, I just wanted you to see that tool about how you can figure up what it's actually costing you to, to make that bell of hay or that ton of hay on your farm. Really good tool. The number one thing that affects, affects our quality, we talk about quality hay and marketing quality hay. And that's the stage of growth when we harvest that hay. This is an old graph from Dr. Roy Blazer from many, many years ago. It's, uh, it is just as profound the day as it was back when he did this research. You can see on the left-hand side, we have the leafy materials here at the bottom, uh, leafy grass, uh, leafy legumes as they start to grow in the spring. You can see we get extensions of legumes and the grasses. Uh, we see the boot stage at the beginning of flowering here, some buds, 
And then in full maturity, we have seed heads and the blooms right here on the legumes and the grasses. If you go across the bottom axis, you see that that is the time. And as time goes out, our plants get bigger and bigger and our yield goes up. You can see that right here, our yield is increased. However, as time goes on and our yield increases, look what happens to our digestibility and intake, those quality factors that can determine animal performance. You can see they're inverse related and they go down as time moves forward. So where's the ideal time to cut that hay? If we cut it right over here on the left, we get little to no yield. If we cut it over here on the far right, we get a lot of yield, but we get very low quality. So where we wanna to aim to cut to get that quality forage is right here where these lines intersect, okay? And for most farmers in Kentucky, that's gonna be just about the early part of May, somewhere from about May 1st to about May 10th. That's when we should be targeting our first cutting. So but getting that cut at the right stage of maturity is gonna have the greatest determining factor of the quality of that hay. Some different quality indicators that we look at when we have a forage analysis done. Uh, we can look at TDN, total adjustable nutrients, crude protein, ADF, NDF, NDFD, RFV, RFQ. All of those are good quality indicators. All of these are numbers that you're going to see on most forage tests. And I don't want to pick too much on any one of these, although we will talk about a couple here in a moment. Um, these you will find on your test results. And depending upon the nutritionist you're talking to, the county agent you're talking to, uh, the feed salesman you're talking to, they're gonna put an emphasis on a different one of these quality indicators. So I don't wanna to focus too much on all these and spend a lot of time, but you will see them and different people balancing rations will look at different ones of these indicators. However, the best indicator of quality is how those animals do on the hay that you're feeding. That is the number one indicator of the quality of that hay. Again, it goes back to the animal you're feeding, whether it's a dairy animal, a beef animal, a horse animal, we'll touch on that. But this is the best indicator of quality for hay that there is out there. I've got a couple of shots here of, of uh, some charts on crude protein and TDN. You can see the chart on TDN here. Right here, you can see the crude protein below. Again, this is for a thousand pound beef cow. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. This is a 500 medium frame, 500 pound medium frame steer. If we were had a feedlot and we were backgrounding some calves, we could use that data. But I don't wanna focus on the thousand pound cow that we can see over here on the right. I have two soil tests that I want, excuse me, I have two hay tests that I wanna look at today. Um, one is a mixed grass hay. You can see that right here. It was sampled last September. Uh, you can see that we had really good moisture on that, about 11.25, so it was good and dry when it was baled. We have a crude protein of 7.88 on a dry matter basis, and we have a TDN estimated at 50.95. So if we look at this 1,000-pound cow and our TDN requirements down here, you look at the stage of her production, if she's in the second trimester, she needs about 47 to 48% TDN. And we look on a lower chart for crude protein requirements and she's gonna need about 7% crude protein. We go back to our analysis, we see that we have 7.88 crude protein. That's gonna certainly meet that requirement there. And our TDN of 50.95 is gonna be more than adequate for uh, the TDN on this upper chart. However, once she has that calf and starts to give a lot of milk and we're gonna to try to breed her back, and so forth, these requirements change. You can see what our TDN goes out to, it's about 67%. We look down at crude protein and we're out about 12. Does this hay that we have right here meet that requirement? Obviously it doesn't. So we're woefully lacking. So in order for that cow to keep body condition or in order for her to give good milk, uh, in order for her to produce a good calf, she's gonna have to have a protein supplement and an energy supplement, okay? We look at a different hay that was sampled again last September, you see right here, a little bit higher in moisture. Again, it says damp hay up here. Uh, that might concern me a little bit, but again, we wanna look at the crude protein. We wanna look at the TDN. We look at this thousand pound beef cow. We look at it again down here for crude protein. Uh, for crude protein, we're at 12%. We've got 18.6, more than enough here. 
We are a little bit short on the TDN. We need about 67, we're at 62. So this particular cow would need a little bit of energy, but not a whole lot compared to the other one that we saw before. But the only way you can know that, the only way you can know the quality of your hay, if you're selling it to yourself or you're selling it to someone else, is to have these numbers and to be able to put these in front of you and put them in front of your customer to show them that your hay is meeting the need for that animal. Going to move real quickly through a few other things here and wrap things up too, uh, fairly shortly. Uh, packaging makes a big difference. Uh, back when I was growing up, this type of package over here on the right, the small square bales, was really the only option we had. Uh, back in the 70s, we started to get the round bales, and now we have just a myriad of packaging that's available. Uh, packaging is important to your customer. It's important to you. Maybe you just use round bales, and that's great. But if you're going to the cash a market, you might be going to the horse market, they might want small squares. Uh, they might be okay with uh, big bales like this. Going to a dairy, you might do baleage in individual wrap bales. Uh, there's tons of options out there when it comes to packaging, but your customer is gonna determine what package you put it in. That customer may be you, or it may be your cash a customer. If you're feeding your own livestock, that's how you're marketing your hay. These are some things you want to be aware of. Again, we talked about keeping those numbers, what it costs you to, to uh, make that hay. You want to match it to the class of livestock. We looked at those charts and how that hay matches up. Some hay works for other classes. Well, other classes it doesn't work for. It's just that simple. Um, we always want to test it. And um, then and only then can you determine the true value of that hay. If you're talking about the cash hay market, uh, it's really driven by supply and demand. And uh, when hay supplies are high, price of hay is going to come down. Hay short, or if hay short in a particular part of the country where we have a drought or a natural disaster of some kind, hay prices are probably going to be up. Um, and export has a great deal to do with that as well. Where can you find the prices of hay and what hay is worth? I get that question all the time. You know, what's my hay worth? There are tons of good barometers out there that you can look at. You can go to different auctions. You know, certain parts of the country have weekly hay auctions. eHay Weekly, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Extremely good publication to uh, check out the prices. Uh, newspapers, word of mouth, internet, all kinds of ways to get information on what prices are around the country and even around the world for that matter. Some of the markets on the cash hay that are available, uh, these are some of the main ones right here, dairy, horse and beef. Uh, dairy market's a very large market. They use large packages. They have the equipment to handle that. Uh, they really don't have too many things. They want high quality alfalfa or maybe a mixed hay, uh, maybe a gas, grass hay if they've got some sick animals or something or some layups. Um, freight's important. Absolutely have to have it tested. They want to see how much milk is coming out of those cows. If you're, if you're trying to sell hay to a dairy and your hay is $20 more a ton uh, than the last guy they were buying hay from, uh, if you can convince them to buy it and your hay puts more milk in the tank, they can run those numbers and say that it's worth it to feed your hay. So there's a way to measure that performance and the quality of that hay that you're marketing. Just some of the hays that they want to mention those, alfalfa, grass mix, and so forth. Horse market, extremely large market. Uh, you're primarily selling the person, uh, although tests are, are becoming more and more part of that nowadays. A lot of hay is still sold by the, uh, what the person wants that's buying it is, I say it's sold on sensory perception. How does it look? How does it smell? How does it feel? It absolutely must be clean of, of mold, dust, weeds, and foreign material. These are high value animals. Uh, thoroughbred horses can range anywhere from maybe a thousand dollars up to, in some cases, close to a million dollars. So you certainly don't want to be uh, selling them any hay that could cause any issue with, with their animals. A lot of different type hays work for horses. Again, you're feeding the person, not necessarily the animal. So I've listed a few different types of hays here that, that work in that market. Uh, you find a particular customer, you become uh, acquainted with them, what their needs are. You may change up your scheme in terms of what you're trying to market them. A beef market is a really large market. 
Uh, you can't have much transportation on it uh, just because they can't afford to pay a whole lot for it. Uh, a lot of feedlots, uh, you say, uh, fill out their rations. So, um, but primarily it's people that, that uh, feed their own livestock with that. Poor beef cattle, they get almost anything. They get like what we, some old refuse, like you see here on the right, that may be run through a TMR or they may get some really high quality alfalfa. Just about anything goes on that. Tons of other markets out there, small ruminants, goats, zoos, nurseries, feed stores. Uh, there's different types of hay that are actually used in medical research, energy, renewable energy, and even in some cases, poor quality hay may be used for mulch. Transportation is very important when it comes to moving our hay from location A to location B. You may just have a pickup truck load or a wagon load that you move to your neighbor. Uh, if you're getting hay in from long distance away, you may use tractor trailer. Again, there is hay that moves on rail across the country. And then for export hay, obviously you'd have to put it on an ocean liner to move it um, across the water. I want to wrap things up pretty quick here. I uh, mentioned foragetesting.org earlier. This is the homepage for the um, National Forage Testing Association. This is a really good place to go to. Uh, they have good article in there on how to take a proper sample, good sampling technique. They have some of the terminology there that you're gonna see on that report when you get back, what it means and that kind of thing. If you don't have a moisture probe um, where you can get one of those, uh, some of the different brands are available. And then the certified labs that are out there to send your hay sample to to make sure you get a good test on it. Just an extremely good website to go to there. I'm gonna wrap up with this slide right here. This is an old slide done out of Wisconsin. You can see that. But basically what it says is if you look across the bottom axis, uh, as your forage quality goes up, again, this is RFV, as it goes up, uh, you see that the price goes up as that quality goes up. Now, we move that out to 2021, we would see that those numbers have risen quite, quite a bit just because of input costs, fuel is up, equipment's up, labor's up, all the fertilizers up, all those things have increased. So in order for farmers to make a profit, uh, these numbers would be higher. But the bottom line is, this is about the succinct picture that says, as quality increases on the bottom axis, the price increases on the Y axis. So that is certainly true today. And when it comes to marketing hay, achieving that quality is paramount. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. Uh, I think we have time left for a few questions. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to entertain any of those questions you might have. Thank you very much.